our world sucks. Let's fix it. The lives of everyone you know are currently being worsened by a hidden enemy with multifarious impacts. That enemy is falsehood. When a man lives discordant with reality, he lives a bad life. The area of philosophy which deals with how to live a good life is called ethics, so errors in ethics must be fixed before one is able to live a good life. But how can we find these errors, and more importantly, how can we find truth? Let's start with a subset of ethics called law. Law deals with the narrow question of who should win in conflicts. We say that the person who should win has the property right in that conflict. For example, if a farmer finds that a factory is polluting his field and ruining his crops, we have a conflict. The farmer does not want the pollution there, and the factory does want the pollution there. Only one party can win, and law is there to find out who this party should be. Modern legal philosophers have come to a precise definition on what exactly conflict means, through the science of human action called praxeology. In short, an action is defined as purposeful behaviour. It is the rational implementation of scarce means towards some end. Let's take the example of cooking a steak. You have the means of a frying pan and a raw steak towards your end of eating a cooked steak. So you arrange these means such that the steak gets cooked and you can enjoy it. With this definition of action in mind, we can define conflict as contradictory actions. Our farmer above can't grow his crops at the same time that the factory pollutes his soil. One action excludes the other. Moreover, this issue of conflicts which law studies only exists insofar as there is scarcity. Two men are perfectly capable of using the exact same recipe for rice pudding at the exact same time. Therefore, there can be no conflicts over ideas. Scarcity, then, is an issue which must be at the forefront of any ethic which purports to speak about solutions to law. We must now analyse different theories of law to see if we can find truth in any of them. First, the utilitarian ethic, which states that the decision of who should win depends on which decision would maximise happiness and well-being called utility in economics. So a utilitarian might say something like, a hundred dollars is more useful in the hands of a poor person than in a billionaire, so therefore it would be just for the poor person to take that hundred dollars from the billionaire. The utilitarian seeks to demonstrate that this hundred dollars would indeed be more useful in the hands of the poor than the rich, by invoking a utility function. And we can find out if this utility function has any scientific basis by explicating the categories of data. The first is nominal data, which refers to simply true statements, such as this video is on YouTube, or I live in Scotland. The next type is ordinal data, which takes the form of a ranked list. For instance, I might prefer chocolate cake to apple crumble, and apple crumble to trifle. Therefore, this preference scale would be an ordinal data type. You can't say that I prefer chocolate cake 3.2 times as much as I prefer apple crumble. Such a statement would be meaningless. All you can say is that it is ranked higher on my preference scale and that I do indeed prefer it. The next category of data is called cardinal data, which comes in two subcategories. The first being interval data. Temperatures are often measured with an interval scale. For instance, it makes sense to say that 70 degrees Celsius is 10 degrees more than 60 degrees Celsius, but it does not make sense to say that 10 degrees Celsius is twice as hot as 5 degrees Celsius. Interval data is characterised by having no objective zero point. Zero degrees Celsius was arbitrarily chosen as a point at which water freezes. This brings us to the next subcategory, called ratio data. Ratio data does have an objective zero point. An example of a ratio measure is length. You notice that zero centimetres is equal to zero inches, which is equal to zero miles. Every length measurement has the same objective zero point, which was not arbitrarily chosen. This is why you can meaningfully say that 10 centimetres is twice as long as 5 centimetres. Literally taking two lengths of 5 centimetres and putting them together will yield 10 centimetres. Moreover, a negative amount is able to have a meaning in a ratio measure. For instance, negative money indicates money that I owe as opposed to money that I own. A negative temperature, on the other hand, just indicates that it's colder than a positive temperature. Here we find the error of utilitarians. They are treating preference scales as ratio level data instead of ordinal data. They are saying that this completely internal feeling of satisfaction with no outwardly visible characteristics is in some way measurable and that this measure of utility is the same between different individuals. At the ratio level, we are saying that the concept of zero utility is meaningful. But how can this be? What is the total absence of satisfaction? Is utility always positive, like length or weight? Or can it be negative? Could dissatisfaction be negative utility, or does that just mean that our actual level of satisfaction is lower than we would like? We are all dissatisfied to some degree all the time, or we would never act. So are we always climbing towards zero on our utility scale, or climbing toward infinity? A ratio level measure it requires a non-arbitrary zero point, but there is no way of finding that. Zero utility is obviously nonsense. 
Again, this is shown to be true before we ask ourselves whether my zero point and yours are the same or different. So the pure utilitarian ethic is dead in the water, but if we broaden it beyond trying to maximise utility towards just trying to achieve some well-defined good outcome, this is the consequentialist ethic, which states that whichever party's victory would have the best outcome should win. Even if we assume that there is some objective definition of best outcome, this ethic is still faulty in that it implies ethical stasis. This is because the future is per se unknowable. We might know that the best outcome would in fact be whichever outcome would have the most chickens being born, but we cannot know whether a choosing A or B to win the conflict would indeed result in the most chickens being born. Therefore, we cannot decide and we are stuck at the starting line. So now we turn to the Rawlsian veil of ignorance theory of ethics. Quoting Hans Hermann Hoppe, in fact Rawls, to whom the philosophy profession has in the meantime accorded the rank of premier ethicist of our age, was the prime example of someone completely uninterested in what a human ethic must accomplish. That is, to ask the question of what I'm permitted to do right now and here, given that I cannot not act as long as I am alive and awake and the means or goods which I must employ in order to do so are always scarce, such that there may be interpersonal conflicts regarding their use. Instead of answering this question, Rawls addressed an altogether different one. What rules would be agreed upon as just or fair by parties situated behind the veil of ignorance? According to Rawls, behind the veil of ignorance, no one knows his place in society, his class position or social status, nor does he know his fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence and strength and the like. It is taken for granted, however, that they know the general facts about human society. They understand political affairs and the principles of economic theory. They know the basis of social organisation and the laws of human psychology. While one would think that scarcity ranks among the general facts of society in economic theory, Rawls parties who supposedly knew about scarcity were themselves strangely unaffected by this condition. Even in deliberating behind a veil of ignorance, one must still make use of scarce means at least one's physical body and its standing room, i.e. labour and land. Even before beginning any ethical deliberation then, in order to make them possible, private or exclusive property and bodies and a principle regarding the private or exclusive appropriation of standing room must already be presupposed. In distinct contrast to this general fact of human nature, Rawls moral parties were unconstrained by scarcities of any kind, and hence did not qualify as actual humans but as free-floating wraiths or disembodied somnambulists. Such beings, Rawls concluded, cannot but acknowledge as the first principle of justice one requiring an equal distribution of all resources. Indeed, this principle is so obvious that we would expect it to occur to anyone immediately. True, for if it were assumed that moral parties are not human actors but disembodied entities, the notion of private property must indeed appear strange. As Rawls had admitted with captivating frankness, he had simply defined the original position so that we get the desired result. Rawls' imaginary parties had no resemblance whatsoever with human beings, but were epistemological somnambulists. Accordingly, his socialist egalitarian theory of justice does not qualify as a human ethic, but as something else entirely. So we'll cross that one off the list, instead moving to the Sternerite anti-ethic, which boils down to might makes right i.e. whoever does win should in fact win. As Sterner explains, whoever knows how to take and to defend the thing, to him belongs property. What I have in my power, that is my own. So long as I assert myself as holder, I am the proprietor of the thing. I do not step shyly back from your property, but I always look upon it as my property, in which I respect nothing. Pray do the like with what you call my property. Rothbard explains the hypocritical nature of such a proclamation. To the Sternerites, only might makes right, and each individual has the right to grab whatever he wishes. It has always struck me as ludicrous for a dozen or so anarcho-Sternerites to swagger around, proclaiming that might is the only right. In any contest of might between the anarcho-Sternerites and the state, who do they think is going to win? For a tiny minority to preach might makes right makes no sense whatever. In fact, what makes sense from either a pragmatic or Sternerite point of view is to proclaim one's absolute devotion to individual rights, even if one doesn't believe it. And what in the world should stop a pragmatic? or a stern right from lying in this way. Surely not devotion to absolute truth, the denial of which is crucial to the nihilist creeds of pragmatism and sternerism. The stern right obligation on stern right grounds to pretend to be a moralist and a believer in property rights runs even deeper than that. For who in the world will deal with or trust any person who loudly proclaims his contempt for property rights and moral principles? It should be obvious to the thickest stern right that if he wants to pursue a ruthless amoral policy of steal and grab, he could not do so by proclaiming sternerism to the high heavens. No, as Machiavelli counseled the prince, the prince must pretend to morality and the Christian virtues while secretly practising the opposite whenever the opportunities arise. Oddly enough, Machiavelli himself violated his own rule by proclaiming Machiavellism, so therefore Sternerism itself requires that Sternerites shut up and pretend to be moralists and natural lawmen, and once again any balking at such a pretense in the name of devotion to truth would, in itself, violate Sternerism by surrendering the Sternerite self-interest to the constraining spook of objective truth. Right, so that one's a contradiction so it's gotta go, but now we move to another ethic, and a very popular one. Democracy. Why not simply take it to a vote to decide who is acting justly? To demonstrate the uneasy position that such an ethic would put us in, consider the following. There are ten people on an island, nine of which want to rape the remaining person. 
There is clearly a conflict over the use of this person's body, so we need to put it to a vote to decide whether the rape goes forth or not. This happens and there is one vote in favour of the victim retaining bodily autonomy, and nine against it. Under the democratic ethic, we have found an instance of just rape. I imagine such a concept would strike anyone with disgust. What of consent, you might be thinking? What of consent indeed? How about to avoid any nasty implications like the one above, we build a new ethic from the ground up with consent at its core. The previous ethics we've discussed can all be broadly classed as statist ethics. Statist ethics in general purport that there exists some set of people who are able to decide who should win in a conflict. Each Sternerite sees himself as a state, thinking that he's allowed to do whatever the hell he wants. The Democrats see the majority as the state, and the utilitarians believe that there should be some sort of central planner with a utility function and a calculator to decide the law. We have seen that all of these are flawed in their rejection of individual bodily autonomy. But what exactly does that mean? What is consent? Let's start in the Garden of Eden, where resources are limitless and can be attained with no more than a simple thought. In such a world, conflicts over scarce means such as berries would not be possible. If Adam wants the satisfaction of eating a blueberry, he can simply think it up, which does not prevent Eve from doing the exact same thing and getting the same experience. It would seem that there is no scarcity and therefore conflicts cannot exist. This is not quite true though. Adam and Eve still cannot stand in the exact same place at the exact same time. In short, their standing room is still scarce, so conflict still can occur. Our goal here is to make a conflict resolution system based on consent first. So let's imagine Eve is standing underneath a tree and Adam wants to stand there instead, so he pushes her out the way. It is clear here that Adam has violated Eve's consent, not the other way around. In other words, Adam has initiated a conflict over the use of that standing room. So we have our rule, do not initiate conflicts. Some terminology you will see here related to this is that Eve has homesteaded her standing room. This just means that she got there first and started making use of it before anyone else. You can also call this initial possession. Another term you'll see is aggression, which means the initiation of conflict. So Adam aggressed against Eve when he pushed her because she owned her body and the standing room. Therefore, let's call our ethic the non-aggression principle. Great, we have a consent-based ethic for the Garden of Eden, but what does this mean for the real world? Does such an ethic still hold up? The answer to this is yes, and in fact it's the only legal ethic that can be proven to be true. First, we notice that the method that someone uses to prove something is called argumentation, and argumentation does not consist of free-floating propositions that don't come from anyone. Rather, argumentation is a human action requiring the use of scarce means. Second, argumentation does not exist in a normative void. There are certain norms that must be presupposed by anybody who engages in argumentation, such that the activity can even be recognised as being an argument. Let's imagine what it would look like without these presuppositions. Well, it would make argumentation lose any definitional significance, as literally any activity could be called an argument. Third, the validity of any truth claim must be raised and decided upon within the course of an argument, so any normative presupposition of argumentation has the special status of being a practical precondition of ascertaining the truth or validity of anything whatsoever. Fourth, to try and argumentatively dispute a normative presupposition of argumentation would be to contradict oneself. We call such a contradiction a dialectic contradiction. For instance, one could not consistently argue that nobody should ever argue, because to do this they must first presuppose that they should be arguing in this situation. So we say that the proposition, people should never argue, is dialectically false. Fifth, argumentation is a conflict-free interaction. Interlocutors are not trying to convince the other through the force of their violence, but rather through the force of their arguments. Specifically, there is some dispute, and argumentation is a peaceful way of resolving that dispute. This means that one of the norms that would even make an interaction an argument in the first place is the NAP. So to try and dispute the NAP, whether on Earth or on Eden, one would contradict himself. Therefore, the NEP is true. This might seem like I have pulled some linguistic sleight of hand or something, but I assure you, the proof is entirely sound, and I have several papers and videos expanding on it in the description below. Right now, let's just apply it to see it in action. If someone were to say that some aggression was just, they're specifically making the proposition that some conflicts are indeed just, which means that those disputes should be resolved violently which contradicts a normative presupposition we discussed above that disputes should not be resolved violently, and as we know, contradictions are false. To resolve this contradiction, they can do one of two things. First, they amend their argument to be that conflicts are unjust, or second, they stop arguing. Doing the first means we've just returned to the NAP. Doing the second, on the other hand, means that their proposition is left empty with no way of evaluating its truth. This is because, as we noted above, the validity of any truth claim must be ascertained during the course of an argument. 
To try and dispute this, one would have to themselves start arguing and thus contradict themselves. As a side note, the same basic structure of this argument can be used to prove the law of non-contradiction itself. This is because the law of non-contradiction is a presupposition of denying anything, and denial is required in argumentation. Say that John and Sarah are in an argument. John says A is the case, and Sarah says no, no, no. A is not the case. To say that A is not the case is to say that the negation of A is the case. For Sarah's response to even be considered disputing or a rebuttal or an even arguing against what John is saying, A and not A cannot both be true. And this is the law of non-contradiction. The name for the philosophy which accepts this ethic of consent is called anarchism, which means without rulers. Early anarchists, called proto-anarchists, didn't have the benefit of praxeology, which was used to define all the core concepts up above. So to distinguish these primitive thinkers from modern anarchists, we call ourselves anarcho-capitalists, or ANCAPs for short. If you're wondering the reasoning behind this name, it's because praxeology was developed by Austrian economists, who place great emphasis on capital theory and the role of the capitalist in general. Okay, we have our anarchist ethic proven to be objectively true, but so what? The world is very, very, very far from anarchist. How on earth are we supposed to move it in that direction? Is such a struggle not entirely hopeless? No, it is not. In simply accepting the truth of anarcho-capitalism and convincing others to do the same, you are driving us towards anarchy. Allow me to explain. There are two distinct classes in society. The first is made up of producers, homesteaders, and traders. They make their wealth non-aggressively by cooperating with others. We call them the productive class, in distinction to the anti-productive class who expropriate the wealth of producers, homesteaders, and traders. That is how they make their wealth. Now this anti-productive class, also called the state, necessarily makes up a very small portion of the population in comparison to the productive class. This is because the state acts like a parasite, sapping the wealth of those productive men in society. When a parasite grows too large, it invariably kills its host. Similarly for the state, it does not produce wealth on its own, instead relying on others to do so for it. This caps the amount that can possibly be expropriated. Imagine there are 100 people on an island, 99 of which want to tax the remaining person. Clearly, after all these vultures are done expropriating from him, he would have no resources left to keep himself alive. They would have killed their golden goose, so to speak. Because the state makes up such a tiny proportion of the population, they could not possibly maintain their activities through violence alone. They could be trivially overwhelmed by the masses of people who they rob. Instead, the state maintains its activities through a state of positive public opinion. Essentially, if the vast majority of people who are being taxed think that this theft is not something that they should actively resist, then the state can continue unmolested. The way the state maintains this positive public opinion is through ideology pushed by intellectuals. Such relationship between the state and intellectuals is a symbiotic one. Most intellectuals do very little and would be out of a job without the government keeping them around. So they propagate the myth that taxation is necessary, or maybe even good for society, such that they may keep prattling on about ancient African battle tactics or niche beetle varieties, whether other people are willing to pay them for this service or not. Thus, a strategy emerges for the anarchist. He must become an anti-intellectual intellectual. To engage in effective anarchist praxis, one must merely convince other people of the plain and simple truth that consent is king, and that this doesn't change just because some nerd in a tweed jacket says so. Insofar as a large population is able to be convinced that taxation is something to be actively resisted, the state will have literally no way of overpowering them. Quite the contrary, in fact this large population could easily resist any attempts at state aggression. Furthermore, now that the state has been thwarted, the rest of the apathetic masses will simply just go along with the flow. You do not need to convince everyone to see the truth. Only a small critical mass is required. And in order to go about convincing this small critical mass, you must adhere completely to the ethic of non-aggression. But you do not yet have all the tools to understand why this is the case. So you have to watch this video where I explain why deviations from principle are strategically impotent impossible, private or exclusive property and bodies and the principle regarding the private or exclusive appropriation of standing room must already be presupposed. What a mouthful. I do not step shyly back from your property, but I'll, why am I fucking doing an accent here?